I'm Jamie Heineman. And I'm Adam Savage. We're going to find out if black and white are colors or not. Oh, yeah. If you've been on the internet over the past couple of years, you're very likely to have seen at least one or two posts claiming that black is not a color. And maybe you've even met somebody in person trying to convince you of this claim. I certainly have. And after some initial resistance, the arguments brought forth might have convinced you that this claim is true. Hell, there's even an article about it by Adobe. You know, the people who made Photoshop and stuff like that. So surely this is true. Well, after not hearing about it for ages, a member of my family brought up those very arguments. And suddenly I noticed that I again disagreed. Without noticing it, the years of working with color on a daily basis had elevated my understanding of them to a level where I could see the issues with the arguments. The topic isn't quite as simple as you might think, so let's take a look at the facts. Before we are looking at black, let's actually take a quick look at white, as similarly many people claim that white is not a color, but just a combination of all colors. This is not true. The argument stems in a single misconception, the misconception that light has color. This is not the case. The property of light, which we perceive as color, is the wavelength. But why is this distinction important? Aren't wavelength and color just two words for the same thing? Well, not quite. Yes, they are related, but they are not the same. Our perception of wavelengths through the means of color is a very imperfect one. Each of the three types of receptors in our eyes responsible for our color vision is sensitive to a wide range of wavelengths, and these ranges overlap. This means that color only starts to exist once light reaches our eyes, and it's highly dependent on said eye. Color is nothing more than a specific stimulation of the photoreceptors in our eyes, and thus not a property of light. This is important as it means that the same stimulation can be reached by two different combinations of wavelengths. A wavelength of 600 nanometers is generally perceived as orange. However, we can evoke the same color by using a combination of two different wavelengths, 700 nanometers, red, and 580 nanometers, yellow. Do you know somebody who has red-green blindness? Well, since 8 to 10% of men are colorblind, you are very likely to do so. That's the same principle. Multiple different combinations of wavelengths that look very distinct to everybody else stimulate their eyes in exactly the same way, making them indistinguishable. In a way, all humans are similarly colorblind, since there are so many combinations of wavelengths that look the same to us. There are many animals much better at distinguishing wavelengths than we are. Once an animal has this many color receptors, it becomes increasingly difficult to stimulate them in exactly the same way when using different combinations of wavelengths. Just think about how many color blindnesses you have. So many of the combinations that look exactly the same to us would be very distinct for them. But don't be sad about your inferior color vision. In some way, the imperfectness of your vision is actually a great advantage. Adding more receptors makes it increasingly more difficult to stimulate them in exactly the same way when using different combinations of wavelengths. As a result of this, we wouldn't be able to mix colors the way we do, and we would probably still have to watch TV in black and white, as creating devices to capture and play back color footage would become increasingly difficult and expensive. If you showed this photograph to one of the animals mentioned before, it would look horribly off to them, just as off as maybe this version of the picture looks to you. Once you realize that color is only a specific stimulation, it becomes increasingly clear that light can only evoke one color at a time. As a result of this, white cannot be a combination of all colors, just multiple wavelengths. It's similar to how compound words have one specific meaning and do not convey the meaning of all the words that they are made up of. Inconsistent does not mean to be in something and consistent, it's just the opposite of consistent, and a bulldozer is not a sleeping animal, it's just a machine. The individual parts lose their meaning once they are combined into a longer word. 
This is just like individual wavelengths don't evoke their relative colors anymore once they are mixed. And don't make the mistake to think that each color has a distinct combination of wavelengths. Only the stimulation is distinct and can be reached by multiple different combinations. Here, let's take a look at another analogy. What if I told you I had a friend named Sarah? Would you spell it Sarah? 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 Or maybe even Sarah? Admittedly, the last one is fairly uncommon, but it gets the point across. Just because you know the sound of a word, you don't immediately know how it's spelled. Anybody learning the English language can tell you that much. The same is true for colors. Just because you know the color doesn't mean that you know the mixture of wavelengths evoking it. Let me show you an example. To read this chart correctly, you need to understand that the color temperature system is nothing more than a subset of the colors which can be evoked by most traditional light sources. This means that two light sources of the same color temperature also evoke the same color. If you look at the color temperature values in the chart, you will notice that there are several close matches here. Let's line them up so that we can compare them. Looking at these, you will undoubtedly agree that the composition of their wavelengths is very different, even though they are the same tone of white or yellow. And yes, the values lined up here are not exact matches, but LED lights are highly adjustable in the color they produce, and if we modified them so that their color perfectly lined up, their spectrums would still be very different. Even if you rephrase the original argument to say that white is a combination of all wavelengths, you would still be wrong. Sure, you need more than one wavelength to evoke white, but you don't need all of them. In fact, two would already be sufficient. Yes, there are multiple combinations of wavelengths causing us to see the same color, but only true colors can be created by a single Ah yes, what a grand argument to make. In fact, this is the very argument brought forth by Adobe's article. And yes, many colors can be evoked by a single wavelength. These are what we call spectral colors. And it's true, white is not one of them. So yes, if you change your original statement to white is not a spectral color, then you would be correct. However, this robs the statement of most of its meaning, as the same is true for most colors. What if I told you that not a single one of the millions of colors that your screen can display can be evoked by a single wavelength. And yes, this was actually the case. Each of the red, green and blue subpixels emits light of more than a single wavelength. So even if only one of them is turned on, you still don't see a spectral color. Let's take a closer look at which colors your screen can actually show you. You might have seen this graph before, but you probably weren't fully aware of what it means. The colorful parabola shape represents all the colors the average human eye can see. Note that this is only a representation, as your screen cannot actually display all of these colors. The spectral colors are located on the round outer edge. You can even find the numbers corresponding to their wavelengths. Any of the colors within the shape or on the straight bottom line of it cannot be evoked by a single wavelength. And the triangle within the shape represents the colors that the average screen can display. Since it never touches the perimeter of the parabola, it becomes pretty clear that such screens are not capable of displaying any spectral colors. If one were to insist that white is not a color because it's not a spectral color, then, well, pretty much none of the colors you see in your everyday life are colors. If you don't believe me, click on the first link in the video description. It allows you to enter a specific wavelength and it will show you the closest color approximation your screen can display. Try to generate the blue of the sky, the green of a forest, or the brown of leaves on a day of fall, and you will notice that you are unable to do so. You can also test this using a prism, or the next time you see a rainbow, as they separate light based on the different wavelengths. Though you might have to exclude the blue of the sky when using a rainbow, considering that it's, well, in the sky and semi-transparent. Let me give you another example in case you need one. Any shade of green less saturated than the green of a laser cannot be created by a single wavelength and is not a spectral color. This includes, for example, the green color of grass. There are only three conclusions one can draw from this. Number one, that grass isn't green. Number two, that green isn't always referring to a color. Or number three, that spectral colors are just a tiny fraction of the colors that we can see. 
If you read Adobe's article carefully, you will notice that they argue for option number one. However, I would argue that option number three makes a lot more sense. The misconception I've focused on so far is the reason why it's so hard for the average person to argue against the aforementioned statement. But why do so many people resonate with it? You might say that it is because black, grey and white aren't particularly colourful. This, however, is just a concept of saturation. There are many frameworks in which we can talk about colours, for example RGB or LAB. However, I want to focus on HSV, as I find it to be the most intuitive. HSV stands for Hue, Saturation and Value. White, grey and black are what are known as achromatic colours. This means that they are completely desaturated. Using HSV to describe them means that their saturation is at 0%. As a result of this, the hue becomes meaningless. But why should we use this arbitrary system? Well, let's go back to the roots and link the logic behind HSV to the anatomy of our eyes. As we've previously established, a color is nothing but a specific stimulation of the three types of light-sensitive cells in our eyes. The difference between chromatic and achromatic colors is only a matter of balance and imbalance. This is the equivalent of what we perceive as saturation. The hue tells us which types of receptors are stimulated the most and the least, and at which ratio. Just like with the HSV system, this becomes meaningless when there is a perfect balance between the three types. This is the equivalent of 0% saturation, or in other words, achromatic colors. The V in HSV stands for value which is simply the overall strength of stimulation across all of the receptors. Based on the HSV system, some of you might want to make a different claim. The claim that it's not a different color if only the value changes, but just a different shade of the same color. This would mean that white is the only achromatic color, while black and gray are just shades of it. And to some degree, I can agree with this. If you shine a bright enough light at a black surface, it will seem white to you. This would also mean that brown is not a color, but just a shade of orange. However, I do have one issue with this. If colors are nothing but a name for a distinct perception, then it's important to judge the question whether something is a color within that context. And I perceive black and white, or orange and brown, as distinctly different from each other. Not to mention that this would also mean that we have two words to describe the combination of hue and saturation, and none to describe the combination of hue, saturation and value. So I would still have to classify them each as a separate color. Now there is one final argument that some people like to make. It says that black is the absence of all light and doesn't stimulate our receptors at all. And if you're making that argument, then all I can say is, good for you, you are correct. However, if you were to make this argument, then you would have been wrong every single time that you've called anything black during the entire time of your life, as you wouldn't actually be able to see a surface that is truly black. Any surface reflects at least a tiny fraction of light, meaning that what you call black is just really dark grey. In the past couple of years, scientists have actually created multiple substances reflecting so little light that our eyes cannot perceive them under any reasonable lighting conditions. But since the receptors in our eyes are not hit by any photons, they can't actually see such a substance. It completely breaks our depth perception. So when people describe looking at such a surface, they typically say it looks like an infinite hole. Most of us are using the word black simply to describe a dark surface in relation to its surrounding. And if you're doing so too, then you're using it to describe a color. That's it. Thanks for watching and indulging me in my need to clarify a simple misconception. See you next time. <laughs>